Today we're going to explore terrible, terrible albums by great, great artists. Let's jump right in, shall we? Welcome classic rock fans to one of my top 10 lists. And as I said in the intro, we're looking at terrible, terrible albums by great, great artists. Edith Sitwell famously said that uh, good taste is the worst vice ever invented. Nevertheless, that shouldn't uh, prevent us from enjoying this laundry list of the truly horrible. And if you can, stick around to the end for some dishonourable mentions. So at the very bottom of our list, or top of our list, depending on how you look at it, is number 10, The Rolling Stones' Dirty Work from 1986. Inattentions, lack of direction, lack of creativity mar this album. Uh, and is a measure of the struggle between Richard's desire to be true to the Stones' original sound and Jagger's desire to be contemporary. It all boils over in this cauldron of, uh, of the 1980s appropriation of a great, great band, all chinos and neon. The best moments on Dirty Work is when they channel that inattention, I think, to uh, produce some really spiky numbers like One Hit to the Body, and a winning ugly, for example, are sufficiently nasty and acrimonious. And one bone of contention for Richards to gnaw at was Jagger's obsession with his solo career at this juncture, meaning that uh, Jagger was rarely in the studio and just popping in to add some lyrics and some vocal lines here and there. And that sense of detachment with each member of the Stones, as I think uh, Charlie Watts and Ron Wood battle some addiction demons at the time, is evident on this record. I mean, the Stones, when they were their very best, represented the filth and the fury of that uh, psychosexual strut that very much defined their best albums. But that's not apparent here. It's a lifeless period production uh, that has uh, dated abysmally, I must say. Number nine is Eric Clapton's Pilgrim from 1998. This is his first album of original material since the 80s, if I'm not mistaken and embraces some pretty tortured themes, which you would think would make for a, a damn good album, considering a man that has uh, his feet firmly placed in the blues, especially with all that trauma to exorcise. But he creates this numbingly gray wallpaper of sound, unnervingly so, I must add. It's kind of like a soundtrack to uh, a 1980s Tom Hanks movie. The music seems very much at odds with the lyrical torment, uh, in the aftermath, of course, of the the tragic, tragic loss of his son. And we even get a song on this album dedicated to, to that dreadful event. But much of the problem with this record has to lie in the production. It's, uh, it relies entirely on stiff and soulless mechanical drum beats, synths and aimless instrumental meanderings that uh, don't do it any favours whatsoever. And even Clapton's singing seems rather staid and mannered. It just comes across as elevator music punctuated with a few guitar trills. Even on some of the more emotionally charged numbers like Circus or My Father's Eyes, Pilgrim, given its context, should be quite a compelling album to listen to, but instead it just comes across as this rather beige sonic pap. Number eight is Latest Record Project Volume 1 by Van Morrison from 2021. This is the sound of Van Morrison boiling in his own piss. And not for the first time, actually, in 1967, he released an album of like 31 little one minute ditties where he um, vented his spleen at all the things that irked him at that juncture, the counterculture, the music industry, rock and roll, lava lamps, you name it. But the mumbling malcontent is doing it all over again 50 years later with this album. In fact, at one point he sings, got my latest joy I'm bringing. Oh, the irony. I must admit I bought this because on Amazon they were selling signed editions. They came with these little signed inserts like that. And I figured it was the only way I was ever going to get anything signed by Van Morrison. Because between you and me, he doesn't strike me as the cuddliest or most approachable of chaps. Rolling Stone has described this album as uh, 28 tracks that come across as a collection of shit posts, subtweets and Reddit rants. At its best, you could say it's an exploration of rage, dark paranoia, and petty indignation. But it just comes across as an angry litany or laundry list of grievances. And in the crosshairs, uh, everything from government officialdom to uh, the herd mentality and social media, of all things. It makes for an interesting listen, I'll give it that. Number seven is Metal Machine Music by Lou Reed from 1975. This album was described by Rolling Stone as uh, sounding like the tubular groaning of a galactic refrigerator. 
I mean, Robert Christgau has dis described this album as unlistenable. It is a truly alienating record, to say the least. This amounts to four sides. Yes, you heard me right. I said four sides and I think you guys were complaining about topographic oceans. Of densely layered soundscape construction of distortion feedback. Uh, guitar runs that are just sped up and slowed down. Producing this squall of sound that kind of folds in on itself. You it said that Lou Reed put this out as a raspberry to his record company to get out of that recording contract that he felt tied into. Who knows? I will say that it lacks any kind of recognisable structure, ensuring melody and rhythm for more modulated feedback and noise music. This was released as a double album in 1978 by RCA Records. Uh, apparently, if Wikipedia is to be believed, it was uh, withdrawn, taken off the market just three weeks later. Number six is Leather Jackets by Elton John from 1986. Ultimate Classic Rock said there are 80s tunes that are great because they sound like the 80s, and 80s tunes that are just great songs with 80s production. However, it has to be said that this album embraces the worst of both worlds and epitomises much, much of what I hate about that decade. And the subsequent unravelling of many, many great artists and the need to sound more contemporary. Awful songs with awful production, dripping with electronic drum machines and synths. It's not even saved by Elton's rich, coke-infused baritone here. Too Low For Zero is also a 1980s album that's much maligned, but I rather like that one, especially the, the title track. However, this one is truly dreadful and smacks of being a, a throwaway album in order just to fulfill a recording contract. Some songs on here, like Hooper Fire, uh, Don't Trust That Woman, Heartache All Over The World, are okay, I guess. But it is fairly forgettable fare. I think even Elton's gone on record as describing this as his worst, worst record. Number five is Sent Anger by Metallic from 2003. This is an experimental piece for this band, which uh, is a good thing in many respects. It's great when artists uh, explore different territories when it works. But unfortunately this doesn't. It just comes across as 18 minutes of spleen venting. Some tracks kind of work, but most don't, it has to be said. But the band coming across as a squabbling squall to be honest with you. I mean, there are some factors that mitigate the awfulness of this record, the departure of Newstead, Hepfield's addiction issues, uh, maybe the anxiety over the rise of new metal, perhaps, who knows? And the CD sounds absolutely dreadful with Lars banging away on a couple of Quality Street tins. There's no guitar solos, uh, the songs are over long, uh, the lyrics are dreadful and creak and strain under the weight of expectation, but never deliver. It's a piss poor effort, has to be said. Number four is Queen's Hot Space from 1982. I've already spoken at length about this record in my video, Where Did It All Go Wrong? But this is um, a dreadful album I feel as Queen Embrace, um, a kind of white funk tempered with the ashes of disco. Just add plenty of uh, amyl nitrate and over compressed 80s sound and voila, we have this masterpiece, which the band themselves have hailed as a bit of a misstep. Body language is a dreadful number on here with, with a video that would make you want to gouge your own eyes out. Put Out the Fire is a good number, and I'd rather like Las Palibras de Amor, if I said that correctly. Although some Queen fans have complained that that song is a little bit too cheesy. Although I personally think cheese is the least of our worries where this album is concerned. You get the sublime and rather tagged on uh, under pressure. But even that wonderful song cannot save this album and in fact comes across as a bit of a diamond in a turd, quite frankly. Number three is Knocked Out Loaded by Bob Dylan from 1986. Despite the numerous writing credits, it does nothing to save this patchwork and patchy album. Bob does the 80s with roomy production, children's choirs, all sounding a bit like a Cadbury's Flake advert. There's some collaborations on here, some covers and, uh, and some original material mined from Bob Dylan's leather waistcoat period. But it generally lacks any consistent and communicable truth where, where Dylan's work at its best always did. If there is one communicable truth about this record is that uh, the 80s are just not for Bob. But even that's a rather crass and broad statement and not wholly true, lest we forget the sublime Oh Mercy from 1989. It lacks any memorable songs that did not do well on the American charts, again, getting to number 53, I believe. 
I think that writing is scant and subpar and its relevance, its cultural reverence is just inconsequential. And there is absolutely no clear vision for it, just pieced together from offcuts from previous previous records. We do get Brownsville Girl on here, which was a reworking of an Empire Burlesque outtake, but even that was described as ridiculous by Robert Criscow. And Rolling Stone went on to describe this album as a depressing affair lacking any artistic direction. Number two is Americana by Neil Young and Crazy Horse from 2012. On this album, he attempts to invest these canonical texts, if you like, these uh, historical tunes with a refreshing sense of relevance. In some cases, you could argue that uh, this is a kind of a concept album, very much in the vein of Nick Cave's Murder Ballads, an exercise in archiving these old-timey tunes like uh, Clementine should be coming around the mountain, Oh Susanna. But my God, it's a clumsy splodge of an album. It's just a lot of sloppy jamming, and in the case of the, I think, eight-minute trudge through uh, Tom Dulo, it's uh, absolutely torturous. The whole thing is defined by kind of a slapdash slackness. But just as the aforementioned murder ballads tops off its orgy of carnage with the wonderful redemptive uh, Death Is Not The End by Bob Dylan, the denouement, as far as this album is concerned, is a rendering of the British national anthem. I mean, go figure. I'll be honest with you, I've never been able to listen to this album in its entirety in one sitting. And number one is Summer in Paradise by the Beach Boys from 1992. This album has no redeeming features whatsoever. It just sounds like a parody, uh, a very sad parody of the Beach Boys. Um, dated 90s production, painful lyrics, no involvement from Brian Wilson. It certainly shows. There's far too many synths and... Uh, there's even some rapping from a no doubt Hawaiian shirted Mike Love. The aforementioned quasi rap number Summer of Love was actually intended for a, uh, a duo with Bart Simpson in the up and coming Simpsons movie. My God, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? But apparently the producers turned it down feeling that Bart did after all have some standards to maintain. Nevertheless, the, this song was platformed in an episode of Baywatch. This was the first album in North America to be released on CD and cassette only, and I believe the CD is quite a collector's item now. It was released in North Korea on vinyl, probably with a, an advisory sticker on it uh, warning uh, concerned parents to keep it away from small children. But nevertheless, this album should be approached with some caution. So as I said at the beginning of this video, the dishonorable mentions that didn't quite make my list are uh, Turbo by Judas Priest, Jethro Tull's Tull.com, uh, Catfish Rising as well is probably could be up there. The Yes album, Open Your Eyes, and even Heaven and Earth is pretty abysmal. ELP in the hot seat, I've refrained from mentioning Love Beach in this video, as well as a few of those Quo cover albums which could be thrown in for good measure. Anyway, I'd like to, if you've watched to this point without switching off, I'd like to thank you for doing just that. Please do click like, subscribe, and check that bell, and check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the sterling work done here at Classic Album Review. And I'll leave you with my closing salvo, which is, as you know, hope you're all healthy, staying safe, but more importantly, that you uh, keep listening.